Uh, Prof, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. So, uh, dexamethasone is going to take some time for us to get used to, but important that we get uh, used to saying that name because it's being hailed as a breakthrough, is it? Yes, good afternoon to you and all of the viewers. Yes, some very good news. Uh, I uh, got the news yesterday on an alert that uh, the results from the study, it's a pretty large study done in the UK, led by researchers from Oxford University, where a drug that we've known for a long time, uh, dexamethasone, it's a corticosteroid, it's used in a range of different indications, including uh, raised intracranial pressure and a range of other conditions. Uh, it's widely available, and what they showed was that in patients who were randomized to receiving this drug, and it's a course of 10 days, it can be taken orally as a tablet or it can be taken uh, as an injection in a drip. Uh, in both cases, it has an effect of saving lives. And it's thought that the way it does that, it reduces the amount of inflammation that causes the lungs to, uh, uh, it, it enhances the, uh, the way in which the immune response can be controlled. Because what happens in COVID-19 is you get a cytokine storm. You get basically all of our immune system coming to the fore, and this is thought to dampen it, and that's how it's thought to have its effect of saving lives. It, it reduced the deaths in patients on ventilators by about a third, and that's pretty good news. So, Prof, why are you sounding so non-committal as the Ministerial Advisory Committee in as far as this, um, you know, steroid is concerned? The words you use are may be considered. Why are you not more um, confident in, in basically saying that we recommend the use of the steroid? So as the Ministerial Advisory Committee and as scientists, we like to see all of the data before we make a firm stand. We don't want to make a firm stand and then learn that actually there's a range of safety concerns or other concerns about this. And because we don't have the published data, we don't have the published manuscript to review, we're just going on the basis of a press statement we can't be definitive at this point. We think that there is good enough evidence in the press statement to take a position that clinicians can now make a conscientious decision to put patients on this drug. But there are also some concerns about it may not be appropriate for every patient, and that's to be determined by the clinician. What we are concerned about is that this drug should not be abused. It only really benefits patients who are either receiving oxygen support or on, on ventilators. Sure. And as you say that, I'm thinking that the last time you updated us about the numbers of hospitalizations, you were saying that many of the patients of, uh, who have the coronavirus in this country don't end up being hospitalized, which also suggests to me that naturally then they don't end up being on ventilators or being on oxygen treatment. So it then begs the question of how much of a game changer is it then if many of you know, the people who have the virus in this country don't fall within the category category of people uh, for whom you are saying uh, the use of this uh, may be considered? So we know that in the case of the coronavirus that, you know, there are a proportion of patients or people who get the infection but have no symptoms. There's also a proportion of patients that have very mild symptoms, and that's the majority. So there's a minority we would guess in the region of somewhere around 5 10% at most, go to hospitals. And of that, a proportion of them will require ventilation. The issue is not that it's a small proportion. The issue is that with this particular coronavirus, because it's spread so rapidly, 
that even a small proportion of patients translates into a large number of patients coming into the hospital. And they all come in at once because of the way in which this virus spreads so quickly. And so that's why to be able to get patients off ventilators and to create space for the next set of patients who will need ventilation is quite important. And that's why this drug will in all likelihood make a, a, a difference to mm. our mortality rates. Prof, before my time runs out, I want to talk to two issues. The change in the testing strategy. Uh, there was criticism of the strategy that was based on mass screening and from that producing you know, a number of people that then go on for testing. That in the context of questions of availability of these testing kits. They're not just widely available. What's the direction we're headed in um, as we go into level three, as we are now in level three of, of the lockdown and opening up many, many sectors of our, of our society? Yes, I think there's some confusion about uh, what our testing strategy is uh, in terms of people not fully appreciating or understanding it. So let me explain. We've had since the start of the epidemic, we've had, we've been through four different testing strategies because our testing strategy has to change as the epidemic changes. So when we initially started, we focused on travelers and trying to ensure that we tested travelers. Then we focused on hospital patients, particularly patients with pneumonia. Then we decided, well, we've got to have to know what's going on in the community. And so our testing strategy included symptomatic people in the community. So our, our strategy has been clear. Now, it's not a problem of our community testing strategy. Our problem is we don't have enough tests. And that's not because of somebody is to blame. It's just that there's a global shortage. And that global shortage is now compromising our ability to do all of the testing we'd like to do. And so now our testing strategy has changed once again. We now prioritize the patients with the available tests that we have. And community testing is now a very low priority. And in fact, we have systematically moved to a situation where instead of testing patients from community screening, they simply go into, ISO, into quarantine. So there are many different ways we have to consider how our testing strategy works mm. and how it needs to adapt to changing conditions. Right. And so right now we focus on hospital patients because that's the highest priority. Lastly, Prof, talk to us about the Western Cape and the picture that's emerging there. On a daily basis in the last week or so, we've been reporting nationally more than 3,000 um, you know, confirmed cases of the coronavirus and many of those being in the Western Cape and the number of people who are dying in that particular province also coming uh, you know, second to that being Gauteng at the moment, but also you have the Eastern Cape. These hotspots, what is happening particularly in the Western Cape that's leading to this continued surge in the number of cases and the number of people who are dying? So the Western Cape is going through a situation right now where community transmission, in other words, the epidemic has become seeded in a range of different communities uh, in the Western Cape. So how did that happen? Well, at the tail end of the level five restrictions, we started seeing some outbreaks occurring and they occurred largely in grocery stores, in supermarkets, some in factories, pharmaceutical factories and so on. And those uh, outbreaks, we identified them a bit too late because what happens is that the virus starts spreading before somebody gets ill. And so by the time they get ill and they get tested, they've already spread the virus to others. And so by the time we established that there was spread in the checkers, in the spas and so on, that in these grocery stores, large numbers of people had already become infected. And once that had happened, the epidemic right. then gained momentum. So we are now in a stage where the epidemic will continue to grow at a fairly rapid rate. What must happen next is that we will right. need to ensure that we can provide the medical care that those individuals who need it. Uh, and we have ensure, we need to ensure that the capacity is available. But in addition, we have to do better in terms of promoting 
our existing prevention. Right. We've got to do better with the social distancing, the mask wearing, the hand hygiene, and that's what the focus should be. Prof, thank you so much for your insights this afternoon. That's Professor Salim Abdul Karim, who is the chairperson of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, talking to us about this uh, steroid, the Dumidexamethasone, mm. uh, which has been shown to be effective uh, in the UK in a study there, uh, in as far as uh, sort of curbing the number of people who end up dying from COVID-19. Mm.